Joining us up front today, renowned author Mitch Album. His latest book, The Stranger in the Lifeboat, it is a great premise for a book. And, and if you will, Mitch, lay out the premise for us. So there's this very rich luxury yacht owned by one of the richest people in the world. He invites all his friends and important celebrities on it. And just before they're about to return, it blows up, mysteriously explodes. Everyone on the boat is killed except for 10 people, five of whom are some of the rich guests and the owner, and five of whom are staff, you know, deckhands and cooks. And they've managed to get to this life raft, and they're in this life raft for three days, floating around in the middle of the ocean. No one is coming for them. They're running out of food. They're running out of water. There's sharks in the water. They're crying out for help. And all of a sudden, they see this body floating in the ocean. And they pull it into their boat and it's this young guy, very nondescript, average looking guy. And they pepper him with questions. He doesn't speak. Finally, one of the passengers says, thank the Lord we found you. And he says, I am the Lord. <laughs> and that's where the book begins. What conjured up this inspiration? What, what, what inspired you for this one? Well, uh, the... To me, I always start with ideas first, and then I weave a plot around the idea. So it wasn't that I wanted to write a book about people out in the middle of the ocean. The idea was that we're all asking for help, especially in the last couple of years of the pandemic. We're asking for help with our jobs, help with our businesses, help with our health, help with our relatives who might be sick in the hospital. But we all expect help to arrive like we ordered a sandwich at a deli. You know, it's like better be here fast, better look like the way we want it. If it isn't, we get disappointed. But it it seems to me that as I've looked back on my life, there have been many times that I thought my prayers were not answered. And yet 10 years later, I look back and I say, well, you know, if that didn't happen, then this wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have met this person, wouldn't have gotten married, wouldn't have had the kids. And so maybe it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Well, if it's the best thing that could have happened to you 10 years from now, it's probably the best thing that could happen to you now. We just don't accept that. So I wanted to write a book about help and how we ask for help and what happens if it arrives and we don't think it is what it's supposed to be. So these people on this boat, they don't think this guy is God. He's, he looks like an average schlub. He gets hungry. He gets thirsty, he falls asleep a lot in the middle of sentences. And so they kind of write him off. But as the days pass and strange things seem to happen, some of them begin to change their mind. And I thought that was an interesting premise. When you set out to do a, a book, on average, from start to finish, when the stranger in the lifeboat came to you. Is it a year? Is it two years? Is it start and stop and you come back to it? Uh, no, I don't start and stop. I'm, uh, that part, I, I, I dive in and I stay on that one for a while. I always answer that question like two ways. It's, it takes a lifetime and a year. The lifetime is to think of all the things that end up going into the book that led you to the idea that you wanted to do the book, which has been a lifetime in the making. And the process for me is about a year's time from the time I sit down and go, okay, here we go. First sentence to writing through. I don't start, stop. I don't keep novels in my drawer the way that I know some of my friends who are novelists do. And they say, well, I'll come back to that one in a few mm -hmm. years. I'm like a project oriented guy. From Tuesdays with Maury to right up to, to, to your current project and beyond. What are you at your core? Are you a writer? Are you a broadcaster, a journalist? Um, did you ever think of, of what you are at your very, very core? Yeah, and um, I'm one thing, uh, a storyteller. That's it. I do, I, that's the only skill I really have. Uh, sometimes I tell my stories in fiction. Sometimes I tell my stories in nonfiction. Sometimes I tell them in broadcasting on the air. Sometimes I tell them in movies that I write or plays that I write or even songs. But it's always just one thing. It's just the ability to tell a story. I think I was gifted with that and, and, and only that. <laughs> and so I try to pay uh, honor to it. Were you that way as a kid? You grew up in Jersey, basically. Uh, kid in Jersey, storyteller? Were you telling yeah. stories to your folks, to your friends? Yeah, I was a good storyteller. And I was an observer of storytellers. I was the kid at the Thanksgiving table who... Uh, when all the older relatives after the dessert was served would start to tell the whole war stories and everything, all the other kids would take off and they, oh, we don't want to be here. This is boring. We hate this. And I would sit there like this and I, you know, just, just listening, listening. And I, I observed who could tell a good story 
amongst my older relatives, you know, they were a lot of them were immigrant sons of immigrants, daughters, and they would you know, like the ants, they didn't do a good job because they would get caught up in the details. Like, was it 1925? No, wait, it was 1924. No, no, it was 25. And I would go, ah, stop, we don't want to hear you. But then my uncles, like the ones who were in World War II, and they would say, well, there we were, we were on the hill, see, and they were coming over the hill. We had the guns and they had the bullets. And, and, and you're, you're like enthralled by it. And I would say to myself, that's how you tell a story. That's how you keep, you keep it moving, you keep it guessing. And so I always say, I learned how to be a storyteller, a writer at the, at the dinner table, at the Thanksgiving table. And it fascinated me then, and it fascinates me now. And something you've talked about down through the years, you know, the way you were brought up, and you were brought up, um, came from New York, you came from Jersey, neighborhood, you're going to be in that neighborhood for forever. It's kind of the way they think back in the Northeast or anywhere else for that yeah. matter. But your folks said, think beyond that. Get out yeah. of here. You know, it's funny. Uh, it's interesting you know that. I mean, you probably read it somewhere, but my uh yeah my parents we lived in a just a little average blue collar neighborhood nobody ever left when you got married and moved out you just moved like a couple blocks over you know and, and that was it you know maybe somebody moved like 10 miles away that was like, oh my god where'd they go and my parents always said to me you know this is not the end of the world don't stop here you know explore go places travel whatever and they encouraged you know we didn't have a lot of money but they encouraged us to go any chance we could and eventually we did and all three of us uh, three three you know two brothers a brother and a sister all of us lived overseas eventually and and spent a lot of our time in foreign places and later my mother lamented the idea because they stayed in that area mm -hmm. and they said why did we ever tell you that you know all of our neighbors, <laughs> every Sunday night, their families come over, they bring the grandkids, they have, well, then you guys are, we have to take airplanes to come see you. I never should have told you that. <laughs> and we said, well, it's too late. It was a good idea then, and we, we ran with it. And, and as you look at it now, good idea, do you tell your kids the same? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was the right thing. It was the right thing for us because it, it gave us perspective. You know, travel gives you perspective. Uh, seeing other places gives you perspective. I operate an orphanage in Haiti uh, that I have for the last 12 years. And I'm there every month of my life without fail. And I will be for the rest of my life. That has given me such perspective on, on what's really important and what, what we complain about here in America, what we call poverty here in America, you know, what we call struggles here uh, to, to be with those kids, to deal with that country. A lot of Stranger in the Lifeboat was, was written down in, in Haiti with the kids sitting around me and uh, and kind of inspiring me because they have this amazing faith and this amazing belief that things are going to be good, even though all their possessions fit in a 12 inch by 12 inch cubby, you know? So uh, yes, it was a good idea. It was the right idea. And how powerful from your estimation, whether it's your kids or your folks, how powerful is that parental? I mean, obviously it was in your case, but on a one to 10 scale, how powerful is the parental do this? Don't do that. The advice. Uh, I think it's uh, it's about the biggest power we have. You know, uh, you know. I, I once wrote a, li a line in a, in one of my earlier books. Before a, a boy believes in God or anything else, he believes in his father. You know, and and I remember feeling that way. You know, like my father was the biggest biggest thing there was, and my mom was in her own pantheon. You know, and and um, I think everything I am is a result of their upbringing, and that's why I take raising the kids in Haiti so seriously. And then I'm there all the time and I'm constantly talking to them because I recognize that we're taking kids who in many cases, they don't have parents. They don't have any other people to guide them. And if you're not there doing it, you know, they're going to take some other shape, but if you can help mold them and, 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 and guide their ideas, they're going to grow up to be great people. And if you can, we can shift that into, as this book is released, it's holiday time. And Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Hanukkah, and New Year's, there's a lot of, of happiness. There's also a lot of sadness, and emptiness, loneliness that comes up at this time. To which you say what to people who, who may be, be going through that? Well, uh, you know, a lot of this book, The Stranger in the Lifeboat, was written in, in, out of pain. Uh, I don't know if you're aware or not, but uh, my wife and I adopted one of our kids from Haiti yes. a number of years back, 
when she developed a brain tumor. Her name was Chica. Chica. And um, we brought her to America and she became our daughter. And we traveled around the world for two years trying to save her life. And in that two years, we got to be this amazing, unusual family of, you know, a couple that were in their late 50s and a five-year-old girl from Haiti. But it was beautiful. And, uh, you know, of course, I lament that every day. And at the holidays in particular, you know, she had a couple of Thanksgivings and Christmases with us before she left this earth. And in the book, um, you know, I try to put the questions that I had for God or the universe into the mouths of a lot of the people who are the survivors on this life raft, you know, these castaways. Mm -hmm. So at one point they ask him, well, if you're God, you know, okay, fine. You say you're God. Do you answer every prayer? And he says, I answer every prayer, but sometimes the answer is no, which I have found in my life that that turns out to be true. And another time, one of them asks him, you know, he's lamenting his wife who has passed away and he gets angry at this God character and says, why do you let people die? You know, why did you have to take my wife? And God character says, well, people on earth always ask when somebody dies, how come God took them? A better question would be, why did God give them to us? What did we do to warrant such amazing times and memories and, and sweet interactions with them? How did we deserve that? And, and he goes on to say, I know that you cry when people you love leave this earth, but I can assure you they're not crying. And for me, you know, I wrote that for the book and in the book, but I wrote it as much for me as I did for the readers, because that's how I have had to deal with my loneliness to answer your question and, and, and my wife's loneliness of, of missing our child and, and my parents who died in the last six years, uh, both of them. And, you know, you're, yeah, at the holidays, you're alone and you can weep and you can sort of say, you know, this is terrible and by myself. Or you can say, we didn't lose a child, we were given one. You know, we didn't lose our parents. We had this amazing life with them. They influenced us every, every which way we are. And wherever they are, they're not crying. So our tears can be comforted by that. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I take solace in that personally. And I hope other people who read Strange in the Lifeboat do as well. And, and by the way, <clears throat> pardon me, the book you were referring to, Finding Chica. I mean, that, that was what came out of all of that search. That's right. um, you look at the positive then all the time, don't you? You n manage well, to find that. Uh, you know, nobody manages to find the positive all the time. Um, A lot of the time. The best you can do is set your compass towards the positive and try to sail towards the positive. You know, that doesn't mean your boat's not going to go this, there, and the other. You know, I'm human like everybody else. But I've, I've seen the alternative. I've seen the negative. I've seen what life is like when you have, you, you just take the worst case scenario all the time. And it's not, it's not fun. And it's not some way that I want to live. As we close out, the, the pandemic is, it's kind of going away. It's kind of not going away. What has it been like for you uh, in Detroit? If you've traveled and you have traveled, uh, what has it been like for you? How's your life changed? Well, uh, I'll answer that in, in the sections that it breaks down. So in Haiti, it's terrible because between the COVID and the kidnappings that take place on the street every day, our kids have not left our little orphanage in nearly two years. They have not set foot outside our gates in nearly two years. And it's only a third of an acre. So it's, it's not like there's a lot of place to run around. And it's just literally not safe out in the streets. And that's been extraordinarily difficult. Um, here in Detroit, uh, and you know, when I'm here in the pandemic, for us, it was it, like for a lot of people, a bit of a blessing, you know, it got us to stay home, have dinners together. We had several of our kids who had medical conditions from Haiti, they were up with us, and then the pandemic hit, and all the travel was closed down. So for six months, we had two uh, nine-year-olds who lived with us and just, just brought such joy into the house and such laughter and singing and noise. So I always say for, for us, the pandemic was this enormous blessing. We had these big dinners at night with the people who were staying with us. And we never went out to eat, which was normally my pattern. You know, we just stayed at home and cooked everything and got to know each other a lot better. Uh, so there are pluses to everything. Even being stuck in a lifeboat out in the middle of the ocean, you can find some positives. And uh, we found a lot of them during COVID, but that's not to say that it wasn't extraordinarily difficult on everyone, especially 
down in Haiti. And finally, as that lifeboat sails into 2022, what are you what are you hoping for in in the coming year? Uh, contentment. That's all I ever hope for for me and for everybody around me and health. Everything after that, this is all just gravy. Talking about a book with you on a on a on a show, come on, that's how much better does that get? You know, how many people don't get an opportunity to do that in their lives? That's it's all gravy. You know, as long as we can walk around and we're healthy, especially after, you know, seeing losing a child and, and losing parents, you know, within a couple of years, the old and the young, and you see how everything is so dependent on health and, and all of your happiness and all of your ability to do anything or dream or think of doing everything is so affected by your health that if I have health and, and, and contentment, I, I don't even want to put anything else on the list because I feel like I've been way over blessed as it is. And do you have both right now? Oh, are, are we healthy and content right now? At the moment, at the moment that's that's and, and everything. It can all change at a, at a whim. Uh, the book, the latest book. By, by the way, are you working on something else that we should know about? Just uh, you know, I like it. When, a, when, a, when a book comes out, I try to spend some time talking about it and giving it birth into the world. I'm doing a lot of touring around and talking about it and visiting. I already have the next book in mind, uh, which will come out in two years but I haven't started working on it yet. I'll, I'll do that as of first week in January. I'll sit back down and start my process. And do you bounce it off your wife or do you bounce it off friends or just the premises? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. I bounce it off my wife, friends, other people. Um, my wife, uh, I have read my wife, every one of my books um, out loud. I don't think she's ever read one in print because I read them to her as I'm writing them out loud. And she sits right here where we are can't really but she sits on the couch over here and I sit over here so that I can't see her face because I don't want her seeing I don't want to look at her and see her go yeah that was terrible so <laughs> I, I, just, I just read it out loud over here and I wait until I'm done you know reading it and I learn a lot from reading a book out loud and she says she likes me to read them to her she that's the way she likes to absorb them and she gives me great input on on all of them she's heard every one so before we close it, last night I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm going through notes and just look up at the bookshelf. And as I said, at some point, our, our paths never cross, but the interviews that I know from my end were set up. I look up on the bookshelf and... Yeah, timekeeper. Yeah, it's a good one. One of, one, of many that's, one of many that's up there. And that's a good feeling it's got to be to look up at your bookshelf and look and, and, and say, there it is. The, the, what, what is that feeling like? I, th I always say that the nicest uh, tactile uh, feeling that you have as a writer is uh, when you get that box delivered to your doorstep and uh, you rip open the box and there's this hardcover little book, you know, that you, that you, you know, wrote and you say, wow, you know, like it, it went from here to here to here to button press to, to this and now you have something you know like that will last forever and it's a one, one of the wonderful things about books that even i don't think uh movies or or songs or anything like that quite have the same thing because you know you, you, people don't own them the same way but a book that you can hold on to that you can pass on to somebody else you know uh there's something beautiful about that you know very romantic I guess if you grew up like I did with books and libraries, you know, before everything was digital. And um, yeah, it's one of the great moments of being a writer is uh, seeing your book arrive. And those books are arriving now. The latest, The Stranger in the Lifeboat by Mitch Album. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. The best of everything. Continued success to you. Uh, we'll look forward to talking with you again. And uh, we'll wait, await the next project in the next book. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks. That's kind of you. I enjoyed talking to you. Take care.